It's one o'clock. We'll go ahead and call the uh, monthly um, healthcare district finance meeting to order. Um, first item is the changes to the agenda. Um, Catherine, before you walked in, there was a request to move item number two, the CER for uh, ecocardio package um, to uh, right, or we're going to do it right after public comment, if you're okay, okay. with the way Mr. Klein can get back to work. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, item C is the approval of the minutes. That's on pages three and five. Everybody's had a chance to look at that. <clears throat> Yeah, if there's no changes, we will send that to um, the consent agenda for the full board. That looked pretty, pretty good to me. Yeah, I agree with that. Yep, I'm good with okay. that. Okay. We'll send that to consent. Uh, item D is public comment. Is there anybody in the public that wishes to be heard or anybody on Zoom that I didn't see? We don't have anyone else. Nobody else. Okay. Then we will move on to the uh, capital expenditure request, uh, the ecocardiology package. So take it away. Seven. Yeah, that's on pages 27 through 40 of the packet. Well, this was brought to our attention through uh, Carrie here. Um, uh, that the uh, echo machine that we currently are utilizing is going to be on uh, end of life status for its software updates, which would put it into security vulnerability for the district. And so we kind of got some um, quotes through GE retrofit our current uh, ultrasound machine to continue the service or to get a secondary um, new standalone echocardiology machine. Um, however, we kind of feel that the recommendation of us is to carry on with the just retrofit of our, our current machine due to cost and um, um, utilization of that time will be fine with um, both departments using the same machine as well. Um, the kind of breakdown for both of those is the quote for just retrofitting our machine will be 15,000 um, and a changeover. And then if we do the, the new machine, it'll be 135,000 roughly. And um, with the new machine, we're also going to have to continue a new service contract, which could be in the tune of ten to twenty thousand a year as well. Um, with the retrofit of our current machine, we can remove our current um, let's see current contract for service on our Echo machine was twenty two thousand for twenty twenty two, and with the retrofit of only being a fifteen thousand dollar cost, I feel like it's a pretty good recommendation for the for the district. I don't know if there's any other questions regarding it. If any any security vulnerability questions, I think Harry can address those better than I can. Do we have any idea of how long it would take to complete that upgrade? So that we this because obviously the system would be down. So the upgrade is 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 quite simple. Um, the package is already installed on the machine. We just don't have access to it. So it's a simple flip of flip of the switch. Right. We gain that access, and then we just wait for the delivery of the probes plug in the probe, then you can immediately start um, um, action with it. And it should be maybe an afternoon of downtime, maybe a few hours to get the software tuned up and get everything up. Uh, How about training in. for the tech stuff? Training will be for um, Joe, our current um, tech. Yeah. And there we, I think we do offer one day of service or through the, through the contract here of getting um, training for her. And then if she has any questions, you know, they're really good with us continue, yeah. continuing forward. Or she has been great with us. So very good. Okay. Uh, Catherine, do you have any questions for Stuart? Uh, I do not have any questions. I mean, it sounds like the most feasible way to go to me financially and probably time-wise also. So, yeah, I would agree with the recommendation for the expenditure. Okay, and Carrie, you don't have any um, concerns about security vulnerabilities or anything like that? Well, yeah, this is to fix that problem. So I'm obvious punch if we do this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. Well, okay, was... yeah, I would make a motion that we accept this. And then because of the amount, that's something you can 
do we don't have to send it i think we stopped it we'll still send it through for consent yeah. or just for review we can send through consent yeah okay someone yeah. pull off if there's a question i doubt there will be all right i'll second that so Thank okay you. we'll send that to the uh the consent for the next board great very good thank you thanks Stuart. Thank, thank you thank you Stuart. absolutely thanks, thanks for having me See how nice you are the first time you come through? I know. Thanks for the thanks. I wish you could do that in the next time. Thank you very much. Yeah. I was in a room. Like, was he sweating? Well, this? it wasn't. It was just, I could hear the difference. It's a little nervous. Breathing. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> I've been right I, there. I, I went to school with him, so. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, love okay. how he threw Carrie's name right out there first. So it, he was like safe mm -hmm. one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. Carrie recommended this. Oh. <laughs> I'll take the heat. <laughs> yeah. but a reputation of throwing Carrie under the bus if anything goes, anything goes wrong. Right. That's true. Great. <laughs> well, for security, it's huge in the first place. If <laughs> this one is actually a big one. Uh, the e -E, I mean, I don't know how much I want to explain, but for time, but it, every piece of machinery runs an operating system. This particular operating system, Microsoft hasn't supported for like 10 years. And oh, so wow. since we started doing all these scans and stuff, you know, you don't even know that that's there until it's identified because it's not like your computer that you sit down at. It's right. all hidden behind the scenes. So um, it's a big one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to the November uh, financial reports and uh, Mr. Recupero, welcome. Uh, we'll Great. start with unaudited statements that's on pages six through 23. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. So I'll go over to the shared screen here. And let's see if I can figure this out here. And we'll go So we're going to start on page eight. The statistics. Okay, I make it bigger. So Tim and I have had conversations recently. It really bothers us as we get older. The the, the print seems to get smaller and smaller. So <laughs> I was just <laughs> thinking that as I'm trying to read these numbers. <laughs> I'm having to adjust my glasses up and down. No, we're gonna try to make it this as big as we can. Uh we're gonna start out talking about this is November, so we're five months through the fiscal year. So uh whoops something just happened here okay so line eight we had a real solid month on the acute side 123 patient days budget 111 so um it uh was uh that's nice uh 10 percent over budget number on the acute side a little bit of a negative because we have this rule that we have to stay for the year, have to stay under four on line 15 on as far as average length of stay. So we had a couple really long lengths of stay that caused the average to go over four for the month. And we're keeping a close eye on our year to date number on row 15 because hopefully and by year end, uh, according to regulation, we need to get this number down to 3.99 or lower so we're, we're right at the threshold now at 4.02 so we'll keep a close eye on uh, making sure uh, as the fiscal year goes on that we uh, try to get back under four again but that is a good number financially to because it carries uh, a lot more dollars on the acute side so that was a, a real busy month on the inpatient side uh, moving down, uh, line items 32 and 37 has to do with the ER and the clinics. And similarly, they were both slightly, a little bit below budget for the month uh, on both ER and clinics. You see 32 had a ER visits of 580 compared to 628. And 37, the 1170 uh, clinics to 1270 budget. So a little bit off budget on, on those two line items. The last thing I want to talk about on this page is lines 44 and 45. Those are FTEs worked and paid. 
can see 197 is less than budget. So we actually had less FTEs worked and also less paid. Those are all obviously favorable that we want to have less staff uh, for on the expense side. So that was a good thing. However, when we get over to the profit loss statement, we'll see that our salaries were higher. So the combination of lower FTEs and higher salaries means we've been paying our people a little bit more generously than what we had in the budget. So we're trying to do catch up over the year and get people uh, hi higher in their pay rates. So I really want to kind of emphasize to the board and to the staff that administration is doing everything we can to keep up with pay rates for our people. And that's showing up right now as we see uh, the FTEs down, but the salaries higher. So anyway. Well, I want to take a look at also with the salaries, uh, Dave, is the contract labor, because contract labor was substantially lower. Yes. Uh, when you take a look at that, it offset that increase in the labor. You know, good, good okay. point. We'll, we'll get to that. That's a good yeah. point. Uh, oh, yeah. The other thing I have in my notes, I should go back. There is one item that has some significance. We're not really doing as many line 16 swing beds. Oh, wait a minute. Line is nine, it? nine is the, the, so a year to date, we're only like a, a third of what we have in the budget. We really wanted to get that number up higher. We're starting to do more the last couple of months, but it's still quite, quite a bit below on year to date, 105 compared to 300 on swing bed days. So that's a little bit, hopefully we'll be able to get uh, those numbers a, a little bit higher uh, the rest of this year and, and start doing more swing beds. Is there just not the patients meeting criteria or? There are, we, we're seeing a lot more this month. Uh, you know, we've actually got four in house right now uh, versus four inpatient. And so that's been the trend has been continuing a lot of the month there. And so I think um, some of it was again because of the, tr the changeover that occurred with the Medi-Cal managed care situation. There were some things that we had to do there, I guess, in order to make them qualify and get them on. And so the staff figured that out, and now they're working more towards uh, identifying some of those those cases. Whereas I've spoken with Dr. Gross about it as well. Uh, because sometimes it has an impact on their reimbursement because they get to see them technically once a week right? Um, versus every day. They play with it. And then the other issue that we've had with the swing bed sometimes is you get some of these behavioral patients that get put in there who were in there for a long time. And, um, and we have a very, very difficult time getting them out of there. And so sometimes we end up filling up our beds then based on our nurse staffing availability. We try to make sure that we leave room for the acute patients. So obviously that's better for us and so forth. So we try not to fill those beds up too full in order to make sure that we can handle the acute cases when they come. And we have how many, six beds or? No, there's, we can see up to 10 right yeah. now based upon our current nursing staffing. So I think there's eight in house today. Uh, Tim is um, the change of order with um, the, the is it, I'm sorry, is it Medi-Cal or Medi-Cal you said? Medi-Cal. Uh, Medi-Cal. Is that the same reason why the, um, like on the acute side, why we're over the, the, the 4.0 ratio or, or is no, that separate? That's just, just a pure like this day issue for, you know, the, the severity of the cases that we're seeing in there. So. Okay. okay gotcha. Okay. So, I mean, we've been doing a lot better on that the last couple of months. Uh, you know, like I said, we're literally right at that threshold of four. And so um, uh, continue to watch that. So okay. I don't think that's going to be a big issue for us, even if we were right at 4.02 or whatever, when we, we got done uh, considering where we were <laughs> during the pandemic. So All right. definitely better. So. Cool. Thank you. So I'm going to move on to uh, page 11, uh, the graphs, uh, monthly trend, uh, last three months trend, real positive here, last three months on net income, bottom line profit. Uh, last three months have been good. Uh, there was uh, a discrepancy, two different numbers, and I want to point out that this number is not the correct number. It's 3.76 on financial strength. So so I'll fix that for the full board meeting where we'll show this month of November 
moved up to 3.76. So that's a correction that needs to be made. The other thing I had in my notes was to, uh, uh, you can see a little bit of inching down on the ER. I don't think that's any reason to be concerned. It's still pretty close to budget. It's not significant, but we're going to keep an eye on it. Uh, I think there's probably less flu. The virus hasn't really hit much and people aren't sick, which I guess is good news. <laughs> the last thing I have that I keep a close eye on is when I do the projection for year in on cash flow, I really want to see how we're trending in terms of where we're going to finish the year with the ending balance. And that number, because of the higher IGTs that we're expecting in, uh, the IGT line item is right here. You see this 14 million, that's a huge number that's coming in the fourth quarter, uh, will get us up to uh, 24.6 million, which you can see is significantly better than what we have in the budget. That's a combination of the higher IGTs and less seismic spending Although this last month, uh, Bob did submit quite a bit, almost two hundred thousand in uh, in invoices. But we had a whole three million in our budget just in case we needed it for that the, the completion of the uh, uh, emergency generator. Which I don't know if we're going to get completely through that for the, this fiscal year, which will, causes our balance to be to be a little bit higher there. But that that's all positive as we need to be prepared for having as much as possible before we go into the project as we know with inflation hitting the estimated costs on the seismic project that number continues to rise so the more we have in there the, the easier it's going to be for us to complete the project so that's a good thing the next item that i wanted to talk about is on page 13 which is the liabilities on the balance sheet. And line item one, accounts payable, 1519 Last month, it was 2102 So almost 600000 reduction on the accounts payable. Is, so Amy, Amy and her staff is doing a good job getting that cleaned up. And we're going to continue to see that number drop closer to where we were at the end of last year you can see it was 1.3 million so uh we're heading back down again the uh next page is 14 uh, current profit loss statement for the we're just going to look at the month of november starting out with line one we talked about it being a solid month for acute care. Well, that's inpatient revenue. And you can see here where our actual 1,580 compares favorably to the budget of 1,398, which is a 13% favorable variance on the inpatient side. So it was a really good month on it, inpatient. Overall, we still are not hitting budget on a lot of the other line items you can see the 9.8 it's a little bit under budget in total we're four percent under budget uh although we had a well close to what we had a year ago on total revenue uh the uh more, probably more important number is where we finish up after we make the adjustments on deductions from revenue we come up with line 11, which is probably more important number for profit loss. And that number is better than budget by $248,000 because this section here on deductions is lower. And why is it lower? Well, we continue to make favorable adjustments on the discounts and allowances here. I put in parentheses, this includes where IGT show up as we show less discounts when we get a higher amount on IGTs. So because that's a significant adjustment this year, that's helping us as we get down to the net revenue, even though the gross is lower, our net is higher. So that is uh, really where a lot of our financial success is happening this year. Uh, Tim received 
an extra 1.6 million uh, that he picked up in a check that a health plan uh, had available for us that we weren't expecting. So uh, that those are all, I I opinion is a consequence of us having good relationships and good uh, negotiations with our our health plans that they are willing to help us out when it, when extra IGT money is available, and we were able to, to succeed this year and get getting a higher amount uh, from the health plan. Moving down, you can see line thirteen continues to show uh, a higher than budget number on total operating revenue. On the expense side, here in what Tim was, or uh, yeah Tim was talking about. Is hey, we were over by forty thousand, but look at line sixteen contract labor, better than budget by fifty four. So because we're using less contract labor, we have more salaries and wages. So that may be as much or, or a bigger factor than the pay increases, is we're showing a higher salaries, paying our people a little bit more, but a lot less than what we would have had to pay if we had to pay contract labor which is a good strategy to have is to keep that contract labor number down as a min minimum amount as possible. Overall, our expenses were slightly over budget for the month, a little over 1%. And uh, bottom, bottom line uh, was a healthy, almost 250,000, 246 compared to the budget of the 95. So we had a good month in November considering everything, the, the higher acute, the uh, lower deductions from IGTs and the improvement on contract labor, nets us out uh, 150,000 better than budget. For the month of November, you can see the higher IGT amounts here at one almost $2 million. Going to year to date, Paige. Do I have any questions so far? I'm probably going too fast. Uh, should I keep going? Uh, I would say keep going. Okay. So year to date, and I keep looking at this number, and it's not really looking very good. If we talk about overall growth for this year compared to last year, we can measure it by line six in total gross charges. So $48,707. Then we go to the far right column. A year ago, after five months, we were at 50 million 412. So that tells us we're a little bit down in terms of volumes because we did have a 2% rate increase. And even with that, we're showing less in total charges. So even though we're doing well financially, it's not so much due to the higher volumes, it's the IGTs that causes the benefit because when you get down to line 11 what we have for the year on that which is probably more important is close to 15 million 14 million 9 12 in a year ago it was close to 13 million so we're, we're uh, like 2 million higher on the net because of the IGT improvement so not as much volume but the IGT is making up the difference so what's going on on the expense side this year? Well, we all know we gave that 800,000 bonus, which uh, we didn't put in the budget, but we we had already known it was going to be there. We weren't sure if we were going to do it the last month of last fiscal year or this year, but it does cause this number to go up higher by 800,000 on the year to date number. But so without that bonus, we would be under budget right now. Um, because the actual variance is only 638 when the bonus was over 800. So, so you could look at it that way that we are managing our expenses compared to budget. Uh, however, when we know that what's going on on a national basis with the higher inflation costs, everything's more expensive. The supplies, purchase services, our, our pay to people are, is more and we're trying to keep up with inflation. Well, as it turns out, our own internal inflation, when we compare this number on line 28 of 15,606, the grand total expenses for the first 
five months to a year ago, the grand total expenses, that's an 8.9% inflationary rate. The problem with that is we know the third party payers, Medicare, Medicaid, and insurances aren't giving us 8.9 inflation adjustments on our rates. So long term, if we keep that trend, we we end up having we end up uh, eventually starting to show operating losses and operating cash flow deficits. So we can absorb it right now because we've had good positive years, but it is a concern. Now, the other place we make up some of that difference is in IGTs. So thankfully, this number on top is going up because of the IGTs. Uh, that's what's saving us this year. As long as the IGTs it maybe make up the difference that for, that Medicare and Medicaid aren't making up and paying our rates, you know, maybe that's how hospitals are going to survive just with supplemental might end up being our only way to keep the doors open is to continue to lobby for uh, more supplemental. And I think what we're, we're going to see that as a lot of hospitals, unlike us, are struggling, and that's the easiest way for the state of California and for the feds to fix that problem is to increase some of these supplemental programs. And we, and that's seems that that seems to be the trend. So hopefully that will continue and will be also part of those increases. And some of the things too, Dave, you know, again, we're seeing more and more of the rural hospitals that are in financial difficulties. Yes. That are able to come up with the cash to, oh, do yeah, yeah. Cash in order to get the IGTs. And so what happens is, that leaves more of the money left in the pool, which then gets spread to the rest of the hospitals that can. And we've been lucky because we've had the cash. Right. Obviously, that we've been bankrolling for our, our, our uh, building and project and stuff like that. So we've been actually able to get more GICT and we should be able to going forward based on forecasts and stuff. Exactly. So that, that does help us because we got the cash in the bank. And that's why I always take a little bit of time in every report to look at that cash number and we don't have to apologize for it because it does position us to take advantage of the IGTs and other programs uh, for investment by having that ready. And, and also the fact that we did, weren't, didn't get the community support to do the seismic project. So we have to do it on our own. The other uh, item that I keep, it's a moving target line 39. This is the highest number I've had so far because the, the news has been favorable this year. I'm now up to showing, this is the gross number. It's not the net. The net, you'd have to bring it down by about $8 million. But the gross checks that are expected to come in this year as it relates to IGT is $19,217,000. So extremely good and high year for IGTs that we're seeing so far. Now, after I did this report, the news changes every week. Well, we got one piece of news. There's one program we might not get 300,000 might might be delayed a little bit. So the number continues to change, but it's still a really, you can see a much bigger number than we had last year in prior years. Uh, and thankfully, so that's going to really probably be the main theme for this year in terms of how we've done financially as we are thankful that we've done well on the supplemental. And again, the supplemental isn't doesn't just come to us automatically. We have to manage uh, our, our relationships and, and and with good negotiating skills to get the most we can get and, be, and take advantage of opportunities when they come up. So uh, uh, it's just been one of the main themes that I have to emphasize is uh, thankfully, even though everything else isn't going perfectly on our financial picture, the IGTs, uh, at least at right now, are making up a big part of the difference. So uh, there's another agenda item. So I'm going to stop here because I think we'll have a separate agenda item when we look at the product line. So that's my report for this part of the agenda. <clears throat> any questions for uh, for Dave? I don't have any questions. None for me. Okay. Thank okay. you, Dave. Considering the circumstances, I mean, it's still really good news to have at least a pretty good bottom line for, for this month. I mean... Yeah, I mean it's weird that we we spend so much time talking about something that's not traditionally 
financial when we talk about something like supplemental money, but it's uh, it's the way the government has decided to pay, uh, especially small rural hospitals who are struggling. Yeah. So I'm going to get down to product lines. So we're finally back uh, after a lot of uh, work. Yeah, that's page. page 24. <laughs> and this is about as big as I can make it. I'll make it bigger. Okay. So let's start out with med surge. And because we talked about the month of November being real solid for inpatient and acute, well, we in fact see it here in the med surge section. For, this is the top section is just the month of of November and we see line 12 med surge 247 uh profit 81 budget so uh, I know historically Chet would show med surge not hitting budget well I can I can be Chet on year to date because let's stay in med surge and let's go down to the year to date number and on line 25, med surge 283, budget 766. So med surge continues to underperform year to date. Mark's not here to defend himself. So <laughs> hey, he'd be happy just it's a positive number instead of a negative number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sir, it was always negative. <laughs> but because uh, it, it's really hard for med surge because there's a lot of overhead that goes in there. Uh, over a million dollars and you can see the budget only 966 so so he, he they get charged a lot on the inpatient side uh for uh so the overhead expenses continue to go up for give you an example uh that the, an overhead expense for all of the, the product lines has to be absorbed is is just uh the increases we've had in uh fire and casualty insurance went up like 30 percent this year on uh, on our uh, property and casualty, you know that that's an overhead expense that has to get spread across the, all these product lines, and Med Surge gets a, a piece of that. Uh, so that's an example where uh, it's harder for these product lines to make money when you have big increases like we've had in certain categories like insurances and other overhead expenses. Uh, the next thing I want to point out is. Um, sniff now sniff came close to budget last month it was improved volume uh, almost uh, a little bit off 121 to 119 problem with sniff down to year to date we're about a million dollars already after five months below budget so the way i look at it is an opportunity there's a lot of potential to the bottom line if we ever get back up to budget again on volume for sniff, you know, you can see even after five months, if we were at budget, that's a million bucks. So we've, I can do next time. I think I'll show you a, a uh, contingency where what our bottom line looks like if we go up and five, 10, 15 extra on the census. And you can see how much more the, uh, the bottom line goes up as we add volume. So I know Chet emphasized that that volume and sniff really has a lot to do with our productivity. And he is correct. There is a cor correlation there between volume and product and, and profit as it relates to the sniff product line. The other thing too, just in looking at your deductions from revenue, obviously we budgeted, you know, 58.9. And we ran that unit uh, 73.9. Yeah. So, you know, versus, you know, they can look at med surge, which came in at 50, 56 or something like that, 57. Right, right. So, yeah, yeah, that's so, good point. This is the mix, obviously, we see more write offs on that stuff, which is what impacted. Because, like I said, if that came in close to what med surge did based good on the mix, this would have been an entirely different number. So, good um, point. Yeah. So, it's, there's, there's a lot of variables, there are variables that go into this stuff. Yep. Uh, ER looks strong. Uh, and I believe the way Ch when I looked at some of Chet's reports, ER was typically one of the best product lines, if you guys recall, and it continues to look good uh, for the year. Uh, line 25, 3.1 million. So uh, really good shape. A lot of the IG, extra IGT money is is earmarked for ER patients. It's Medi-Cal. Uh, 
state of California is saying we under we're underpaying you normally for ER for Medi-Cal. So we're going to give you all this IGT money to make up the difference. So ER, when IGTs go up, ER gets the benefit of showing less in uh, uh, more net revenues because of the IGT. The uh, clinics um, don't really have anything significant there. Uh, a little bit down this year. Uh, obviously, we really haven't done much in surgery this year, and we are going to talk about our strategic plan. We are looking at possible other options for the square footage there to maybe use utilize that square footage to get more revenue out of there if we can find other alternatives. If we decide not to really try to ramp up, uh, Tim is intentionally not overpaid physicians to come here. A lot of hospitals have made mis big mistakes in hiring surgeons and paying them 600000 a year and getting hardly any surgeries out of them because of the fact that there just isn't the volume. And you end up really, you can lose 10 times more just by trying to keep a department open. So it may or may not, we'll, we'll have to go through that process of deciding whether or not the surgery product line will continue going forward. Um, I We do have a lot of enthusiasm about our retail pharmacy. We can see the volumes are higher. Uh, we're still not quite where we wanna be on the expense side yet. A lot of the expense improvements, it's called the 340B program, happens uh, down the road as we uh, get a cumulative effect of all of a sudden having a big discount on our pharmaceuticals uh, through the 340B program. As we go through the months, we should start seeing our pharmaceutical and drug costs drop because we're getting more and more uh, prescriptions earmarked and qualified for the 340B program. So we're confident about that. What I did on this report, a little different than Chet, because I wasn't sure exactly how Chet did it. I decided to make this report all inclusive so that when you see the bottom line right here, it matches to the bottom line of the financial report. So uh, I, I, um, uh, I want to keep it close to that so that we we, we have it all inclusive, all the revenues, all the expenses show up on one of the, the uh, what is it, eight product lines that we have here. I don't know specifically how, how Chet reported this. T Tim said he kind of went over every line item, every number, and everybody would be fall asleep halfway through it. So I didn't want to do that. Uh, but any, any particular area we want to discuss, John or Catherine? Oh, go ahead, Catherine, if you had a question. Um, I guess just, I'm going to go back to the skilled nursing because that's what I do, because that's oh, okay. where we need to make some um, really good improvements because that would change a lot of the bottom line. Yeah. But I know they've all gone to the Medi-Cal HMOs. So, um, and I'm assuming that when we do those, we're making sure that they have that coverage or we're, there's somebody there to make that call mm -hmm. or we yeah. can just be able to send a form in right. to get it changed. I don't, I don't know how that goes. Yeah, now, fact, so. Three more referrals this morning that uh, uh, Sally had sent me and uh, we're looking at, she's planning on one more admit probably this week. Uh, she'd get us up to 44 in there. And so um, we're uh, like, I said, we're looking at everything that's coming through. You know, there's a there's a, a database, I guess, that they put these out on that goes out to all the facilities. And the facilities, we call them to try and get the patients that we think are going to be the best matches for us and so forth. So, and a couple of these were, the ones I saw this morning were a little bit more complicated cases. And I kind of challenged her to say, maybe we could take this one or not. You know, so we're, we're, we're pushing that a little bit, obviously, because now we have staff so we can obviously take a little higher acuity patient than we could have before when we didn't have it. Um, so. Yeah, because we're licensed to. Yes, exactly. I mean, and... Should be doing more. Yeah, so do we do um, marketing 
for the skilled nursing? Mm -hmm. Okay, because I know like um, before activities would go to activities meetings right. or social services would go to social services. Yeah. And, and I guess I've John Sally to get down to, you know, get out and meet with the discharge planners from the various hospitals and so forth, uh, just to make sure that we're out in front of them uh, and knowing. And, and current health systems has been good because they've been sending somebody out here uh, on a regular basis to meet with us oh, and kind of take a look at our patients and uh, what we can do in those kinds of things. So that's, they're the ones who are making those decisions. Okay. So that's helping. And so that's helping us to come over, uh, overcome the, I mean, the obstacles. And I'm yes. thinking staffing, and, and nursing, um, yep. administration, doctors. Yeah. I mean, we all fit under right. underneath there. Um, and then like I said, we'll be developing new relationships, obviously, mm -hmm. once we know who the new people are going to be with Anthem Blue Cross as well, because they'll, they'll be starting January 1. And then also um, not only looking at the hospitals for those that are discharging individuals, but have we continued to reach out to other um, long-term care facilities mm -hmm. for people that are from our community? Yeah. We're actually, what we're seeing now is, you know, the, the, the people that bought the two, I think we've talked about it before, the two uh, board and cares over on the uh, other side of the lake. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how that program's working, but they're pulling patients in from quite a ways away up near Fresno and uh, points north. Um, and they're bringing them down here. And from what we're seeing, I have no idea how they're qualifying these patients to be there because literally as soon as they get here, they're ending up in our ERs. And then from there, they're getting into our acute units. And then, like I said, we've got one right now that we're assessing that's there that actually came from that facility. Uh, is so they're not... Seeing actually meeting the assisted living criteria will be when they walk in right or roll in or yep. whatever so yeah some of them have been like i said i i i have some questions about it and we're kind of looking into that i know that there's been a uh, i heard that there's been some kind of an investigation that's being started on that well and assisted living's private pay yeah so yep. that makes makes a difference yeah. so um, well, hopefully we can start uh, continuing to increase the census. Um, and if not, I know if we were to shut down a wing or change the wing, if you shut down a wing, it's you, you play heck ever getting it back. True. <laughs> We've talked about converting one of the wings, like I said, maybe right. in April. Uh, we Sally and I have had some conversations on that. And, um, you, you know, obviously we, we, we indicated that, you know, again, because there's a lot of of patients out there that meet that criteria. And so obviously we would have no trouble filling that if we right. And I and I know the we big talked question there about finding that. staff and stuff like that. Because especially trained staff and and you know we talked about even from the perspective if we had to go out and pay more to get those staff, it might be worthwhile for us to do that. So we just have to sit down and kind of run the numbers and see if that made sense for us or not. Yeah. But then again you obviously when you bring in those kinds of patients and so forth, you know, because of the way that unit is laid out, as you know, there's no kind of way to isolate certain behavioral issues in that unit nope. from the other patients and so forth. And so it makes it a little difficult to, to manage. Yeah. Um, and there's not a nursing station. So right. I'm sure it would be like activities in that hall. Yeah. We looked at it like but, I said, one time when we were looking at doing general psych, which we would have to create a small, we'd have to take like one room and make a small nursing station, one of the patient rooms. Mm -hmm. So we'd have to give up a better two in order to do that. And but like I said, if we could drive more volume through there, then it might be make sense to lose that bed uh, and so forth. So, okay. um, so yeah, we're, we're looking at a lot of those things. Yeah, because I know, and I know I I bring this up every meeting because yeah, yeah I know, but it, no, we want to fill it. I mean, and there's we know these patients out there that need it. Yeah, it's, it's just, just so I just I guess I'm missing the point of where are we missing the the. The patients, you know, um, they, that's just my opinion. But what I maybe like to do is, is after the New Year's, have you come in and meet with you, me, and Sally? We talked about doing that before. Before, we right? Never get that done yet. So let's do that and just okay. kind of help us. I want to pick your brain too about you know obviously what you know uh, in terms of how that might be able to help. Yeah, point but, in the directions that we haven't seen because it was. And mind you, I haven't worked here for a while, especially yeah. in that you know, but ten years doing the admissions and stuff, um, we, there's procedures that we had to follow. I mean, every day we were faxing, 
not names, but how many male or how many female beds to every facility, yeah. skilled nursing, yeah. hospitals. Uh, and and so they those discharge planners would have that information when they came in. So right. they were calling us right. a lot of the time because they're like, oh, you know, they weren't always calling us with their best patients. Right. But at least we. And they knew you had beds and it was easy. We right? had a we had a relationship. Right. And it's all about relationships. Right? Yeah, we we had relationships with you know. The, all the case managers with the insurances and mm -hmm. stuff. So yeah. that made a big difference too, okay. but okay. well, let's do that. I'm going to skip it next meeting. I'm not going to bring it up. <laughs> and, and I'll continue to do this yeah. report every month. And you guys. <laughs> you didn't believe me. I mean, go ahead. Me? Yeah. yeah. Did you have a question? Right. Well, I was just going to comment a little bit on the marketing thing, because it's been something that we've been working on right. recently. So uh, our current plans, and we're supposed to have some sort of um, advertising language created Today, I think the guy said it's usually late, so sometime probably next week. But um, we should have some advertising language that we're going to create a, a radio ad. Um, Brandy Ruland over there is going to be the voice of that radio ad. Is the tentative plan okay. um, that you play in the valley? It is also in Ridgecrest to let them know. You know, we do have beds available. And some of the amenities that we have and all that stuff. Yeah, so that people in the both those communities know that that's available to them. Yeah, and sometimes it's by word of mouth and and meeting the community needs, you know, quickly. There's um, there's advertisements, especially um, a place for mom, mm -hmm. which I'm not really fond of that commercial <laughs> because they sell you all these amenities and then you call them and they're like, oh no, we don't take medical patients. Mm -hmm. It's all private pay. Yeah, it's, we're being we're being very strategic in the language we're using. So yeah. That as best as we can, we're filtering as part of that ad as well. So we're not just saying, hey, we'll take anybody. You know, we, we list mm -hmm. strategically the criteria that we have. Um, so we'll see if that happens. I think there's a lot of concern, like especially out in Ridgecrest right now, in terms of what's happening there. There's They have not really announced what's going to happen with their, their uh, skilled nursing uh, facility out there. Um, you know, I hear different stories about they're going to cut it, they're going to want to fill every bed and stuff like this. And so it's just, there's just a lot of concern, I think, within the community. I think it's an opportunity for us to kind of pick up um, just, hey, listen, we're here if you need us, you know, we've got availability. Yeah. And so please. And, and I agree that even though we get the information on paperwork, mm -hmm. you know, everybody knows how documentation can be. <laughs> Very much so. Either scare you away or, you know, well, you blind but, find uh, it another way. But I asked Sally to go out and I want to go out. Eyes on. Yeah. You need to go see what they're not telling you because that's the bigger story sometimes yeah. in terms of uh, what's not. They, they selectively give you information that they want, they think you'll accept. So, okay. and Deb's just texting me now that there's a newspaper ad that's printing this week with uh, the civil okay, information perfect. in Ridgecrest. Oh, Very perfect. Good. Yeah, that'd be good. All right, thank you. Sorry, John, I'm done. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, that's what I was, I was gonna kind of piggyback on too is, um, you know, depending upon what goes on with Ridgecrest, even though they're kind of being absorbed by the East Kern Healthcare District, we might be able to fill some of the vacuum that's, you know, of services that they're not gonna be meeting anymore. Um, whether that might be, you know, finding sniff patients that need to be transferred or, um, you know, even possibly surgeries. And in fact, I'm just thinking, you know, as we've been having these discussions, um, it's been about three years since we did the, the initial three-year strategic plan. And it yeah. might not be a good idea to maybe have a, I don't know, maybe a separate special board meeting just talking well, about this plan. We are, Tom, we're doing that already. We're, the administrative team is we're going to work on a, on a strategic plan that we're going to present to the board for us to consider based upon, like I said, there's like four criteria that we developed and we want to develop some strategic initiatives underneath that so that we think we've got something that's going to be manageable and doable, you know, versus some of the things that came up with that last that last retreat that we had. And so it'll include a lot of those kinds of things. Um, so I, I think we're on the right track. And, uh, you know, like I said, hopefully here in the next month or so, we'll have that put together for everybody. Yeah. Can, um, is there a way to like, I don't know if we've done this in the past, Tim. Um, <laughs> 
community needs assessment to try to get an idea. Like, so like for example, like Catherine's point about the, the, the skilled nursing facility, um, you know, are there people in the, in the Valley? Maybe they're just, I, I hate to use the word, maybe they're just not really familiar that we can admit patients. That's one thing. Or secondly, like with the surgeries, maybe they're not um, familiar about the kind of services that we could do in the surgery suites. I'm just thinking like a way to like get more feedback from what the community might want from our hospital. We um, did that three years ago when we invited numerous groups in to, to uh, assist remember, in the gathering of that information and so forth. Um, yeah, we're I, not required do. to do that. I mean, one of the few organizations, hospitals that does not have to do community needs assessment. Um, and um, like I said, it's not to say that we don't go out and solicit that information because we truly need that. So uh, the question is how you go out about and get that and where you get that from. But, you know, a lot of that thing can be, again, is where identifying is, is what Carrie was saying is, is getting out and just getting that in front of people in terms of here's what we can provide. Here's what we do do, uh, you know, instead of that guess. Because I know my conversations with Sally, there's people that still think that we have a waiting list of patients that get into our sniff. And we're going, no, it's not the case. You know, we've got open beds and stuff like that. So that's my message has got to get out to the community that yes well, we even are, through know. organizations or something yeah. So, yeah so yeah yeah you're, you're we're right gonna together, we're going to talk about all that stuff and, and figure out how do we how do we maximize that that effort you know for all of the service lines so and so um tim when do you think like not january's board meeting but maybe february probably february's we'll okay. have that right because like i said right now we're We've got all the stuff we're trying to do to get year end done, get the uh, the adjustments made. We're converting over the new HR system the first day of January. <laughs> Just a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's going to happen. <laughs> so, anyway. so yes, yeah, so that February is probably a great time for us to get that get that to you guys. Yeah, you're right, Jimmy. I I did sit in meetings where we were getting feedback from the community and I completely forgot about that. So thank you. Thank you for reminding me, but uh -huh. yeah, to, yeah, maybe, I mean, it would be nice if, if some people from the public would actually come to the board meetings to, um, you know, talk about some of the services just kind of as a, you know, one-on-one, -on -one. but. Yeah. It's not like I said, I mean, it's, it's the only time you really see them show up is when they're upset about something. Yeah. We've talked yeah. about that before, you know, and then the trouble droves. It's like I said, yeah. when things are going well and, and stuff like this, then nobody shows, you know, and that makes it hard, you know, no matter how hard you solicit to try and get people to come to a meeting, they don't show, you know. Yeah. So it's like I said, you we, we continue to work, and obviously every one of our employees is kind of out there in the community because most of them live here, you know, so we do have means of getting some of those things and hearing about those things, but um, and like and talking with the other health plans and stuff like that in terms of what their needs are and what they're looking for uh, in terms of getting patients placed. Uh, obviously, now that everybody's converted over to a managed care plan under Medi-Cal, uh, our relations with current health and, and ultimately with, with, with Blue Cross are going to be very important uh, going forward in terms of our understanding what their patient population needs are because they have that information. As Ross said at the board meeting last, last week, incredible information in terms of uh, uh, all of the needs and demands that they have and, and so forth and being able to pull reports for us and so forth. So, and they've actually found that they were extremely accurate in their reporting. So it's uh, one of the big health systems that they, uh, they they contract with to do all that uh, data crunching for them. So it's, it's pretty amazing. So yeah, so there's lots of different ways now, you know, the marketing, the markets are changing obviously because of, of these contractual obligations and sort of with, with the plans. Uh, mm -hmm. and so forth. So, um, but like I said, we never want to lose contact with, with our customers, which is actually the patients themselves. Right. And do we normally just go and list uh, the plans like every <laughs> years or do we cover that? What's that? The strategic plan. Usually we do a three year strategic plan. Okay. That's typically what we do. And, and then, then like I said, quarter, every quarter we have a review on where we're at with that. Okay. So. And that's just with administration. Okay. It's the meeting we do governance committee we'll oh. over that. Okay. Yeah. So if you're if you're board chair uh, next year, Catherine, you get to have a front seat. <laughs> Thank you. you. Will be on that committee. I, I like it in the front you will seat. Chair that committee. So that... <laughs> but I can be a backseat driver just, just in case you're wondering. Just like my mom. 
<laughs> uh, uh, Dave, I, I really appreciate you uh, taking some time to uh, put the product line uh, summary together. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been a few years since we've, we've seen it in the finance committee, but um, what I like about it is it's got, it kind of gives you the snapshot of every uh, single department, um, you know, the utilization, the revenue, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it does kind of give us like a month by month of what the department is is doing financially. So um, thank you for taking time to put this together. You bet. So okay. uh, that's that agenda item. I think we'll pretty much wrap that up. I know we have still a few other agenda items. Okay. Um, page 25 was the local uh, vendor aging summary. Um, Miss Amy, did you have any thing on that that you needed to talk about or does anybody have any questions didn't have any that i i didn't have any no you're keeping us right throwing in okay if we had okay. we would have questions if there was anything in these aisles of water, right? <laughs> <laughs> those columns and then you'd be like so but other than that we're good thank you <laughs> And then page 26 is the contract uh, renewal. Um, there's any on here that need to be discussed or polled. Are we still doing that supervisory agreement with Heather Berry? I don't know that we are. Um, I'll have to check with Greg on that one. <clears throat> that was up for Lisa Wiley, right? She was right. And she, she was uh, overseeing her training for her uh, at the LCSWs. Is it LCSW? Yeah. Was MSW. No, she I was thought she was an MSW. She became LCSW. LCSW. Right. Um, on the activity connection, um, it's it did it renew in March? I'm just activity connection. That's yeah, the very first one for their for the skilled nursing. Yes, because I know we're renewing it today. Yeah. I mean, reviewing it today. So, yeah. so then it will be up for renewal in March, I guess. Yes. Okay. Sure. And then the eighty, the other one that that's, it's, it's, that I'm holding on right now is obviously Adventist Health, uh, which is a membership for the group purchasing uh, organization. Dave and I uh, oh. and Christine have been looking at the, as to whether we're going to move over with them to Vizient or whether we're going to stay with Premier, who's our current contractor, who's now developed a new um, alliance uh, for the rural hospitals um, and so forth. And from and Dave, you can certainly share your thoughts on this, but from what I'm seeing at this point, it probably makes more sense to just to stay with 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 Premier. Yeah. I think some yeah. of the discounts that they have uh, shared with us that we uh, would obtain, uh, we would get as a result of moving over to them are going to be a little bit higher than we would see with Busy and uh, uh, the other one. Um, they may have a few more services that they have to offer uh, with some of their higher level things, to, but they're not there yet. They're futures that they're selling. And so I really don't, for all it would take to move some of those contracts over, I'm not sure that makes a heck of a lot of sense. And it wasn't a huge dollar uh, no. anyway. So it wasn't and, really uh, the effort. Our manager, Christine, I think would be thrilled if we stuck with Premier. Yeah. So and I, I agree. We just got the other financial analysis and Dave and I have not had a chance yet with everything else going on to sit down take a look at that. So we tell them we'll probably be after the first of the year uh, before we make that decision. But literally to stay with Premier, it's just send them an email with the word yes on it and we're done. <laughs> so, so in effect, that Adventist one would go away. That's correct. And we would have a new contract that would then come through from Premier. So... Well, the only thing that changes the actual contract itself is a premier contract. It just happens to go through the Advent Advent oh, Alliance. See. So the all we're doing is changing the alliance, but it's still within the premier contract. So none of those contracts go away. So we probably just need to rename this one at that point. 
Uh, well, that's all the questions I had, John. Okay. Um, then we'll send these to the consent agenda for board review and approval. There's no other questions. Okay. Um, scroll back up here. Um, I already got number two out of the way. Number three is the hospital services agreement for uh, the Siena Hospital Group. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've got the three contracts here. This is for the hospital physician agreement um, with the Santa Hospitalist. Then it's also the medical directorship for that program and also the medical directorship for the SNF. Uh, and so very little has changed in terms of total dollars spent. Um, what we did was just change the hourly rates, but we left the cap in place uh, for the directorship. Like I said, on the first contract here, it's actually on page 44, 43 and 44 um, under provider compensation. Those uh, hourly, $75 per hour, I think it was $65, it was raised by 10 bucks an hour uh, for the physicians at 60, went from 50 to 60, I believe, for the mid-level providers. Uh, and then we changed them down below, we raised those up a little bit. The bottom line is ultimately capped, uh, or not capped, but it, it's there's a guarantee in place that remains the same, that's not changing. Uh, and so uh, and it's pretty rare that they actually hit against that cap. Uh, and so, uh, and Dr. Gross is fine with that. He's, he wasn't necessarily looking for more money, just again, by increasing that hourly rate, it's, it affects the, the total hours commitment uh, that he has to be here on site. But uh, again, he still has to be here anyway to provide that service. So this was a, a relatively minor change on this contract. Um, those are the only things that changed. And then on page 49, uh, this is the acute medical director agreement. Um, and so this one, this is on page 40, on page 50, uh, the hourly rate under section six there uh, went up to $200, which is consistent with what we've been doing with the ER physicians uh, for their hourly rates uh, and so forth. But the uh, not to exceed remained at $6,000. So it just means it's 30 hours of, of time that he puts in. He get paid up to 30 hours. If he spends more time, then it's still the $6,000. So, um, so this is really to reflect more of community standard with the hourly rates and so forth. The, um, that was the only change made on that contract. And then the last one, which is on page 55, was for his medical, the medical directorship for the SNF. Uh, here we did have a slight increase, and this is on page 56, uh, and that was, again, we again, the $200 hourly fee, uh, but it went from $3,000 to $4,000 per month. So that was the only increase that we had on any of these three contracts. So, uh, and those are, those are warranted based on the time that he's putting in for those services. So. And so my question would be, the because he needs to see each patient every 30 days. Mm -hmm. And so when, when we get a higher census, mm -hmm. are we going to revisit that or because? I'll give him a, a few. Can... Uh, and the reason I'm asking, because at the rate as this is the directorship, this only affects the administrative time, not his patient care time, not his patient care time. Correct. OK, so the only one that affects patient time would be the first contract, the hospital which was patient. which we raised 10 bucks okay. an hour and stuff like that. So and so does he bill separately then for the we bill. time we see them? We bill that. We build that for him. Mm -hmm. There's a timesheet that they turn in for the directorship portions. Okay. Yeah. Everything is, is has to have a timesheet associated with it. Okay. It's signed off by him and by uh, Sally and myself. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And those are the three contracts. And the idea here was also to put these all on the same renewal date <clears throat> so that they would come up together from here out. And so they're one year contracts with two renewable one year extensions. No. Okay. And Karen, are you okay with sending that to consent? I am, John. Thank you. Okay. We'll send it to Heidi. Okay. okay. 
And then the last item is uh, on page 61 through 63, the ESPY services, uh, USAC filing plan for fiscal year 2024, a carry. Yeah, so I just threw this in here as kind of an informational thing. Um, this is a company that we signed contract with well, a few months ago. Um, and essentially what it does is it assists us in getting the funding that's available through USAC for IT stuff, um, reimbursement on bills. Um, so it's stuff we were kind of aware of, but not in the full capacity. And we certainly didn't take advantage of it if it's full capacity. So this company is going to help us do that. Um, this is all going to be in fiscal year 2024 is when we're going to be able to file for this. Um, and it kind of briefly describes it on page 61. Um, on page 62, kind of shows what is eligible. And then on page 63, uh, it is showing our estimated yearly um, funding. So right now, and again, this is all subject to change. It has to be approved by USAC. Uh, but in, in talking to them, they felt pretty confident that this is close to what we'll be getting. Uh, reimbursement annually is about $164,000 for our existing IT expenses. That will come in bill credits um, directly from the companies. So, so the money that we've been spending already through this company, that there's opportunities to get reimbursed for some of that stuff. So yeah, that's this has actually thing. worked out. It's a really great contract. Mm -hmm. So their fee is about 22% of that, uh, $164,000. So do some math there, I guess. Um, but still well over you know, $100,000, $135,000 or so um, of reimbursement that we we'll, should be receiving. Amy spent a ton of time getting all of our invoices to be able to yeah. submit to them. We had to submit all these invoices to SB to be able to have them go over and figure out what was eligible, you know, just kind of scour through all of this with great detail to figure out, you know, maximize what they could get us. And so uh, she helped a ton in that. So thank you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Maybe, maybe $164,000 a year. And so <laughs> we'll, um, so this gives you an idea of what they will be able to cover and what they won't, or will we still be sending them we will, this all is, invoices? We, and they... we have a five-year contract with them. Okay. So uh, as new services get introduced, we will send them those invoices. Uh, there's pretty tight criteria for what is able to be reimbursed and what's not. Um, so we'll send them everything yeah. and you know, let them figure it out because that's what uh, they're there for. Perfect. Okay. Does this need to be consent to or... Uh, no, this is information. This is more informational, yeah. Okay. Okay. All righty. Well, thank you guys. Uh, there's nothing else. We're adjourned at 207. So, very good. Thank you. Great. All Thanks. right. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right.